their hands down and, and you know, clean and reach their skin and, and all of that. And submits his hands to the swarm. Their agony is unmistakable. Did you know that in certain cultures, people consume the ashes of their deceased relatives as a way of honoring them? It might seem unusual, but for the Yanomami tribe in the Amazon jungle, it's a meaningful tradition for remembering their loved ones who have passed away. However, this is just one example of the many fascinating rituals found in remote areas worldwide. Join us as we reveal the shocking revelations of ancient tribes. Chapter 1. How the Yanomami Tribe Honors Their Ancestors Deep in the Amazon jungle, there's a tribe called the Yanomami. They live in Brazil and Venezuela and have a special way of remembering people in their tribe who have died. This tradition might seem strange to us, but it's very important to them. It's called endocannibalism, which means they eat the remains of their dead family members. But it's not like it sounds, it's done with great respect and love. The Yanomami people live in small groups in round-shaped houses. They rely on the rainforest around them for everything they need. They farm using a method where they clear some forest, plant crops like bananas, and then move on to let the land recover. They also hunt and fish. The rainforest is not just their home. They believe it's connected to everything, including their own lives. They think that if the forest is harmed, they will be too. This deep connection with nature is a big part of their culture. Their tradition of eating the remains of their dead is about showing respect. For the Yanomami, it's a way to keep the person's spirit alive. They don't do this with everyone, but with people who were close to them, like family members. Other tribes around the world have similar practices. For example, the four people in Papua New Guinea and the Wari tribe in the Amazon do something like this too. They believe it helps them deal with the sadness of losing someone and shows honor to the person who died. When a Yanomami person dies, their body is burned. Then, the family crushes the bones, mixes them with the ashes, and puts this into a banana soup. They believe that eating this soup helps the dead person's spirit find peace. They think that by eating the ashes, they are keeping a part of the person with them. It's like the person lives on through the family. To us, this might sound scary or weird, but for the Yanomami, it's a beautiful way of remembering and honoring their loved ones. It's about keeping the connection with those who have passed away. This tradition shows how different cultures have their own ways of dealing with death and keeping the memory of their loved ones alive. This practice is a powerful example of how people can see life and death differently. The Yanomami see it as a natural part of life, and their rituals help them accept it. It also shows how they believe in a strong bond between the living and the dead. By eating the ashes, they feel like they are bringing their loved ones into their own bodies, making them a part of themselves forever. The Yanomami's way of remembering their dead makes us think about the many ways people around the world honor those they've lost. It challenges us to be open-minded and understand that what might seem unusual to us can have deep meaning for others. Their tradition is a reminder of the diversity in human culture and how these practices help communities face sadness, remember those they've lost, and keep their memories alive across generations. Venturing into the Amazon, where ancient rituals test the bravery of the young. Chapter 2. Enduring the Sting Deep in the Amazon rainforest, home to towering trees and age-old traditions, the Satare Mawe tribe upholds a challenging ritual, a test of bravery that has been passed down through generations. This ritual, called the Waumat, is a crucial part of a young boy's journey into manhood. In this ritual, young men of the tribe face a daunting challenge. They must wear gloves filled with bullet ants, known for their extremely painful stings. The sting of a bullet ant is often compared to the pain of a gunshot wound, and it's one of the most intense pains a human can experience. 
The ritual involves placing their hands in these gloves for 10 minutes, a time that tests their strength, courage, and ability to endure pain. This isn't a one-time event. To fully pass the ritual and be recognized as a warrior and an adult in the tribe, a young man must repeat this process 20 times, which can span over several months or even years. Each time, they must demonstrate their resilience and bravery, showing no signs of weakness or suffering. This repetition ingrains in them the important tribal values of endurance and fortitude. The bullet ants are carefully collected and placed into gloves made from leaves. When the ants are trapped inside these gloves, they become agitated and aggressive, stinging anything in their path. The young boys must then insert their hands into these gloves, enduring the intense pain of the stings. The pain and swelling from these stings can last for days, but the boys are expected to bear it stoically, proving their readiness to take on adult responsibilities in the tribe. Interestingly, the Satere Maui tribe has a deep connection with their environment, reflected in their unique language and understanding of the forest ecology. Their language has specific words for different types of soil, trees, fruits, and animals, showing a profound knowledge of their natural surroundings. This connection to nature is integral to their culture and traditions, including the Waumet ritual. During the initiation, the boys' hands and arms can become temporarily paralyzed due to the venom from the bullet ants. This paralysis can last for hours, accompanied by severe pain and discomfort. In some cases, the boys might experience hallucinations and uncontrollable shaking that can last for days. To mitigate the effects of the venom, their hands are often coated in charcoal, believed to provide some protection against the stings. However, this is not a perfect solution, and the boys must still endure a lot of pain. From the depths of the Amazon to the spiritual ceremonies of Bali, where teeth are filed to shape futures. Chapter 3. The Hindu Tooth Filing Ritual In Bali, there's a special ceremony that's very important for young people. It's called the Hindu Tooth Filing Ceremony, and it's a big part of their culture and religion. The local names for this ceremony are Mapandes or Metata. This isn't just any regular tradition. It's a deep and meaningful experience that marks the change from being a kid to becoming an adult. For the people in Bali, this ceremony is a huge deal. It's about growing up and changing, both inside and out. During the ceremony, the sharp edges of the teeth are filed down. This isn't just about changing how teeth look. It's a symbol of getting rid of six bad qualities that everyone struggles with. Wanting things too much, being greedy, getting angry, thinking too highly of oneself, feeling jealous, and getting lost in bad habits. These are a lot like the seven deadly sins that some people talk about in Christianity. This ceremony can be a bit scary, but it's also very special. Young people who take part in it are showing they're ready to grow up. They sit while a priest, who is like a bridge between people and the gods, files their teeth. This isn't too painful, but it's not easy either. It's a challenge they have to face. Their families are there to support them, making them feel safe and loved during this big change. What's interesting is that this ceremony is often done in groups. A lot of people might have their teeth filed at the same time. This helps families save money and also shows how everyone in the community is connected. Sometimes, if a family can't afford the ceremony, they might wait until a person gets married or even after they die to make sure they get this important ritual done. The ceremony starts with some special rituals to clean and prepare the young people. They also pray to the sun god, Surya, asking him to watch over the ceremony. After their teeth are filed, they clean themselves again and say thank you to the gods. Now they're not just older, they're seen as grown-ups. This tooth filing is really meaningful to the people in Bali. They believe it helps control the bad things inside a person. But if you're not from Bali, you might never see this ceremony. It's usually just for the family, not for outsiders. Leaving Bali's serene rituals behind, we go to Borneo, where wedding customs challenge the bounds of belief. Chapter 4, Three Days of Waiting 
In a place where Malaysia and Indonesia meet, in Borneo, there's a community called the Tidong. They have a wedding custom that's quite unusual and challenging. Right after the big day, when a couple gets married, they have to follow a rule that's very tough. They can't use the bathroom for three full days. Imagine, just after getting married, instead of relaxing or going on a honeymoon, these newlyweds are watched closely by their family and friends. They can't leave their house, and they have to be very careful about how much they eat and drink. This is because the Tidong people believe something important. If the couple breaks this rule and uses the bathroom, they might face terrible luck. Their marriage could fall apart, one of them might be unfaithful, or their future children could have serious problems. This kind of tradition isn't just something the Taidong do for no reason. It's a big part of their culture and has a lot of meaning for them. They think that by doing this, the couple will become stronger together and their marriage will last a long time. It's like a test they have to pass to show they can handle tough times as a team. Now it's not just the Tidong who have strange wedding customs. All around the world, different places have their own unique traditions. For example, in Scotland, there's a tradition called blackening, where the bride and groom get messy stuff thrown on them. In Romania, sometimes people pretend to kidnap the bride. All these traditions, even if they seem weird, are important to the people who practice them. They're a way of celebrating marriage and hoping for good luck and happiness. So, back to the Tidong tradition. Those three days without using the bathroom might seem really hard and even a bit scary. But for the Tidong, it's a special time. It shows that the couple is willing to go through tough things together. It's a way of proving their love and commitment to each other. And when they make it through these three days, it's a big celebration. They believe their marriage will be stronger and they'll be able to handle whatever life throws at them. In the heart of Papua, a tribe expresses grief in a way that deeply connects to their soul. Chapter 5. The Deep Loss of the Dani Tribe The Dani Tribe, who live in Papua, Indonesia, have a unique and intense tradition called Ikipalan or Ikipalek. This tradition involves cutting off a part of their fingers when a family member dies. It's a way for them to show how sad they are about losing someone they love. They believe that just crying isn't enough to show how much they are hurting in seed. Cutting off a part of their finger is a sign of their deep sadness and the big impact the loss has on their lives. In the Danny culture, fingers are very important. They represent being together, being strong, and being in harmony. When someone in the tribe dies, cutting a finger shows that the harmony and togetherness of the community are broken. The pain from cutting the finger is like the emotional pain they feel because of the death. It's a way to show that the loss has left a deep and lasting hurt. The way they cut the finger is done with great care. They start by tying a string tightly around the top part of the finger for about half an hour. This makes the finger numb and stops the blood flow. Then, a family member or someone close cuts the finger. Sometimes they use sharp tools, and other times they might even use their teeth. After the finger is cut, they use leaves and traditional herbs to cover the wound. This helps to prevent infection and helps the wound heal. Mostly, it's the women in the tribe, especially mothers, who cut their fingers. It shows their role as the ones who take care of the family and keep the family's history. Men sometimes take part in different ways, like cutting the skin on their ears. The number of fingers a person cuts off shows how many family members they have lost. Each finger represents one person. The missing part of their finger is a constant reminder of their loved one. It's a way to remember them forever. But now, because of new religions and modern ways of thinking, fewer people in the tribe are following this tradition. It's more common among the older people in the tribe now. From the somber traditions of Papua to the startling practices of South India, where faith takes a leap. Chapter 6. The Surprising Tradition of Baby Dropping in some hidden parts of old customs, where the ways of the past meet today's world, there's a tradition that's both intriguing and a bit scary. In parts of South India, a really old custom called baby throwing has been practiced for a long time. This involves tossing little babies, 
often just a few months old, from a high place, about 30 feet up, into a safety net. People in these communities believe this strange act will bring luck and health to these very young kids. This practice comes from stories and beliefs that go way back. It is said that a long time ago, a holy man told parents who were losing their babies to a deadly sickness to show their trust in God by dropping their sick babies from the roof of a holy place. As the story goes, something amazing happened. The babies were saved by a kind of soft, hammock-like cloth that appeared out of nowhere, catching them gently. This unusual event happens at a place called Baba Umar Darga in Solapur, Maharashtra, and in other temples as well. Here, babies are dropped from 15 meters up and caught in a big blanket held by a group of men. This group is made up of people from both Hindu and Muslim faiths, showing a rare coming together of different beliefs in this practice. But, this tradition, which has been around for more than 700 years, is not without its problems. People who care about children's rights say that this practice is very harsh and can be really upsetting for the babies. They argue that the fear and shock the babies feel, often seen crying and looking scared, could hurt them in ways we can't see. Even though no one has recorded any babies getting physically hurt, the main concern is about what is right and wrong and how it affects the baby's feelings. Because many people are worried about how this affects the children, the government has stepped in and made the practice illegal. However, some people are so deeply attached to this tradition that they keep doing it secretly in some areas, showing how strongly they hold on to their beliefs and ways of doing things, even when it goes against new ideas about taking care of children and human rights. As we leave the heights of India, we find ourselves in the icy realms of the Arctic, exploring a misunderstood aspect of Eskimo life. Chapter 7 Understanding Eskimo Senilicide In the cold, far-reaching areas of the Arctic, where every breath turns to fog and ice stretches as far as the eye can see, the Eskimo people have faced not just the freezing cold, but also the tough challenge of staying alive. One of the most shocking and often misunderstood parts of their history is the story of senilicide, the supposed practice of leaving old people on ice to die alone. This story, filled with myths and often changed by exaggerated stories, contains some truth about the difficult life in the Arctic. The Eskimo way of life, deeply connected with the harsh environment, required a strong and uncompromising approach to staying alive. In a place where food, clothing, and shelter were hard to come by, the community's survival depended on everyone being able to help. This tough reality created a belief that those who couldn't help, like the old or sick, were a burden during hard times. Unlike the dramatic images of elders on icebergs, real history shows that senilicide, while real, was not as common or sensational as often told. Instead, it came about in extremely tough times, like famines, when the community had to make the heartbreaking choice of who gets the little resources they had. However, it's important to know that even in these hard times, the practice was not common and was often seen as terrible within different Eskimo groups. In these desperate situations, some groups turned to practices like senilicide or even killing infants, but these were acts of desperation, not normal customs. More often, the method of leaving someone was passive. Old people might be left behind when the community moved or were simply left to survive on their own in the wild. Sometimes, an old person would ask for help in dying, believing it was a more honorable and spiritually better way to die than naturally. This request for help in dying was not just for the old, but was a wider cultural practice for various reasons, including pain or sadness. It's important to separate these historical practices from the exaggerated story of elders on ice rafts. The latter, mostly made up in books and movies, adds a dramatic and somewhat Western view to a complex cultural reality. In fact, there's no strong evidence of old people being put on ice to drift away. Moreover, the Eskimo culture of the past is very different from today. The impact of Western culture, money, and government support 
has changed the traditional Eskimo way of life. These changes, along with religious and government influences, have pretty much stopped practices like senilicide. Modern Eskimo communities, while still keeping many traditional ways, have adapted to new ways of living and working that don't need such extreme survival methods. When thinking about this dark part of Eskimo history, it's important not to judge them by our modern standards. Understanding the context, the constant fight against the cold, the occasional lack of resources, and the spiritual beliefs about life and death is key. These practices came not from cruelty, but from a mix of survival, social norms, and spiritual beliefs in a very tough environment. Meanwhile in Madagascar, families honor ancestors with a joyful dance and feast called Famadihana. Chapter 8. The Malagasy Ritual of Remembrance In Madagascar, there's a very special and important tradition called Famadihana, also known as the Turning of the Bones. This practice is all about keeping a strong connection with family members who have passed away. The Malagasy people believe that the spirits of the dead don't fully join the world of ancestors until their bodies have decomposed completely. This tradition began around the 17th century and is a unique way of showing respect and keeping a bond with ancestors. Every seven years or so, families gather to take the remains of their loved ones out of their resting places. They then carefully wrap these remains in new clean silk cloth. During this ceremony, these wrapped remains are danced around the tomb lifted high by family members. This is done as a sign of love and respect. This ceremony is not a sad or quiet event. Instead, it's filled with joy and celebration. There's music, singing and dancing, and the whole family, both living and deceased, is celebrated. Everyone enjoys a big feast with dishes like zebu meat, stews, soups, and sweets, along with drinks. It's like a big family reunion where everyone, including those who have passed away, is honored and remembered. This ritual is very important in Madagascar and is a key part of their culture and identity. People like Rakotonarivo Henry say it's important to thank the ancestors because they owe them everything. They believe their lives are deeply connected to those who came before them, but Famadahana is more than just a way to remember the dead. It's also about bringing families closer together and celebrating life as an ongoing journey. When the ceremony is over, the dead are placed back in their resting places, often with gifts like money and alcohol. They are put in upside down, which represents the end of one cycle of life and death. Today, this tradition is facing some challenges. It can be very expensive to hold these celebrations, and not everyone can afford the cost of the feast or the new silk cloth for wrapping the dead. Some Christian groups in Madagascar don't agree with this practice, and because of this, fewer families are doing it. However, for those who continue with the tradition, it is a very special and meaningful way to honor their ancestors and feel connected to them. From Madagascar's memories, we now explore the secret world of neck rings in Africa and Asia. Chapter 9, The Mystery of the Neck Rings Wearing neck rings is a special tradition in some African and Asian communities, mainly done by women. These rings are not just for style, but are very important for their culture. They show who someone is in their community, how wealthy they are, and how beautiful they are considered. In Africa, for example, in the Ndebele tribe of South Africa, neck rings are a big deal. They are made from materials like brass or copper. Husbands give these rings to their wives as a sign of love and to show that they are faithful to them. The number of rings a woman wears is very important. It shows how much respect she has in her community. The Nibele people start wearing these rings when they are young, and as they get older, they add more rings. This creates a unique look of many rings around the neck, which means a lot to them. In countries like Myanmar and Thailand, Women of the Kayan tribe wear these brass rings for reasons that are a bit different, but still very important. They believe these rings make them look more beautiful. They also think that the rings connect them to spiritual things. Girls start wearing these rings when they are little and as they grow up, they get more rings. This shows not just how they grow physically, but also how they grow in their culture. 
The start of this tradition is a bit of a mystery. Nobody really knows how or why it began. But one thing is clear. Neck rings are super important in these cultures. They are more than just decorations. They show who you are, where you come from, and they keep old traditions alive in a world that is always changing. Recently, some people have started to question this tradition. They worry about whether it is fair to women and if it can be bad for their health. But for many people, these rings are still a very proud part of their culture and their own personal story. This tradition of wearing neck rings is fascinating because it mixes beauty, deep cultural meaning, and some controversy. It gives us a lot to think about, especially in the first chapter of a story that looks at different cultural practices and what they really mean. After the mystery of neck rings, we dive into Cambodia's unique tradition of love huts for young hearts. Chapter 10, Secrets of the Heart in Cambodian Love Huts. In the quiet, far-off villages of Ratanakiri in Cambodia, there's a very special custom among the Krayong people that might seem strange to others. These villagers, who live a simple, farm-based life away from the hustle and bustle of the city, have a tradition for their young daughters that's very important to them. They build love huts for their teenage girls. This tradition is all about giving young girls the freedom to choose who they want to be with. It starts when a girl is around 13 years old. It's like a step into the grown-up world of relationships, but in a way that's really different from what most people are used to. In these huts, girls get to decide who they spend time with, exploring love and relationships without anyone else telling them what's right or wrong. The father of the girl builds this small hut for her, it's her own space where she can invite boys she likes. They can talk, get to know each other, and sometimes even become close in a more romantic way. The people of this village believe that the best way to find true love and a good partner is by really getting to know different people like this. In this culture, it's important for boys to respect the girls' choices. They can be invited to the huts for chats or more, but they always have to be respectful. This is crucial because how they act affects how they are seen in the village and can even impact things like their family's wealth. But this tradition has its dark sides too. The freedom these huts offer comes with some problems. If a girl decides she doesn't like a boy anymore, she can just stop seeing him and start spending time with someone else. Relationships here are often short and change quickly. Also, it's not okay to show love or affection outside these huts unless the couple is going to get married. When a girl gets married, she leaves the love hut and moves in with her husband in her dad's house. Then the next young girl in the village gets her turn to use the hut and learn about love and relationships. Despite the open nature of relationships in these huts, divorce is not allowed in this community. This is really interesting because it shows how their culture mixes the idea of being free to choose partners with a strong belief in staying together for life once married. So, these love huts in Cambodia are really special. They represent a culture where young girls have the freedom to choose who they want to be with, but they also tell stories of quick changing loves and the search for a lifelong partner. As the world changes and becomes more modern, these huts are caught between the old ways and new challenges, between freedom and the limits of a changing society. What unique tradition in your culture should everyone know about? Let us know in the comments, like and subscribe for more.